Public theater is... The public theater is... To me, the public theater is... The space that can be filled by real people. Where I can see bold and experimental theater. Revolutionary. We all know how hard the past few years have been. But here we are in 2023 with an industry that looks, well, somewhat similar to the one we had before. And while some people have fought for a return to normal, the rest of us are left wondering whether or not that before was really the best thing for all of us. So today we stop and take a moment to think about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. We think about the future of theater here on the season finale of Public Square 2.0. Hey everybody, it's Garlia here at The Public. The public theater is... Your work. <laughs> okay. Hello and welcome to the season finale of Public Square 2.0. We made it, and I can hardly believe it. I mean, I can, but I can't. <laughs> it's been quite the year. A year ago, at this time, I could not have imagined that the relaunch of the podcast would have turned into this, a 17-episode season. My name is Garlia Cornelia Jones the Director of Innovation and New Media here at The Public. This season, we have interviewed some incredible artists, all of whom have called The Public Theater home. From our first guest, the Pulitzer Prize, Tony Award, and MacArthur Award winning Susan Laurie Parks, or SLP as she is often called, to Tony Award nominee Robert O'Hara, and the other fantastic individuals we've had on the program. Artists like Marcel Spears, Sahim Ali, Ruth Sternberg, Amrita Ramanan, and Emilio Sosa. It has always been important for us to highlight these artists and staff. Why? Because our work together, the effort we put in every day, is only made complete when you, our audiences, walk through our doors, sit in our seats, and give us the honor of your attention. And regardless of how you visit, whether downtown at 425 Lafayette, where we make our home, inside one of the former New York Public Library branches, or uptown at the Delacorte in New York the City's Central Park, at the site of what was once a nexus of burgeoning culture in the African-American neighborhood known as Seneca Village, we are grateful for the chance to steward these spaces as we share them with you. And I am grateful for the opportunity to continue building out amazing new avenues for engagement, continuing to welcome you into new digital and virtual spaces. Now, the public theater is a pretty big place. With multiple performance venues, departments, and programs, it takes a massive effort from a dedicated staff to make this happen. And one of the most influential people to this process is our longtime artistic director, Oscar Eustace. So, back in May, we took a moment to chat in studio about his career, how he got here, and what he sees for the future. I'm Oscar Eustace, uh, he, him, his, and I am the artistic director of the public theater. Great. Proudly. It's, yeah, it's very clear that we do this a lot, so you exactly <laughs> knew what to, what to say. We don't even have to say the things. Um, so I'd love to start at the, uh, at the, at the beginning, um, and I'm sure a, a, 
a lot, a lot, a lot of people are wondering how one be, becomes an art, artistic dra- director an institution like the the pub. Public, so I'm, I'm curious. Before we start talking about your 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 role now, how, how, how did you even get get here? And I don't mean at at, at the public in, in specific, but what drew, drew you into into this industry in in the first oh, play place? Um, when I was about 13 years old, I got a job based on a federal grant. Uh, in something called the CETA program, the Comprehensive Education and Training Act. And it was one of the last residues of the Great Society. This was in 1972. 1972. And I was a high school kid, and I was being paid $100 a week to uh, appear in The Ugly Duckling and perform it for elementary schools throughout the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. And the, the point of the grant was to try and get nonprofits to train young people to work in their field. Mm -hmm. So in that way, this grant was strikingly successful Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it trained me to work in the nonprofit theater, and I've never left it. What? Um, I fell in love with theater during those years, and uh, when I was 16, I ran away from home and came to New York, which is where you have to come. (laughs) And I was, uh, by that point, I was an experimental theater groupie, and Mm. I'd fallen off with all of these experimental theaters, uh, Robert Wilson and the Performance Group and Charlie Ludlum and Richard Foreman. Mm. And one group in particular, Mabu Mines, Mm -hmm. who I'd gotten to know on the road and gone to festivals with, were in residence at this place called the Public Theater. So I walked into the Public Theater in the spring of 1975 as a experimental theater groupie Mm -hmm. and looked around me and went, what is this place? Mm. Spring of 75, Chorus Line had just opened. Uh, (laughs) So I was walking in at a propitious moment. And literally, I was like one of those little ducklings who walked into the public theater and it got imprinted on me. This is what a theater should be. And essentially, the story of my life then was 30 years of trying to recreate the public theater in various Mm. cities around the world until I got to come back and run the thing itself. Mm. I love that. It's fun. And so the ugly d- of da- of da- duckling, the the Hans Kr- Kr- Christian Anderson, right, right, right. You bet. So you went from that into a, a chorus, chorus line. Well, well. <laughs> Lied so, a little bit. I mean, a little bit in between. <laughs> but I was also a member of a, a com- company that was famous and then infamous for all the children's theater company in Minneapolis. I started okay. acting there. And then I started falling in with these experimental companies that were touring th- through mostly at the Walker Art Center in the mm-hmm. early 70s, and I just got goggle-eyed at this mm. experimental work, and I just got completely converted to yeah. the avant-garde. And it was in that, uh, in, in that guise that I first walked into the public. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So I know your father was involved in politics, right? He was a, a, a district attorney and then involved in, in the of the Democratic Party in Minnesota. Correct. So, so, so uh, how do you think that pol- political involvement affected or maybe continues to affect you, 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 you as, an, as an artist? And I know that your m- mother was also a woman. Studies professor. Do, do, do you think that their social awareness <laughs> had influ, 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 influence on you or has any bearing on, on the shows or pro, pro projects that you will gravitate? Um, I think my family remains enormously influential for me. Mm-hmm. My father and my mother were sort of classic liberal Democrats in the 1960s until the tensions of the 60s tore them apart and my mother ended up joining the Communist Party Mm -hmm. and marrying a third generation Communist Party member who Mm -hmm. was my stepfather and remained my stepfather until he died in 2014. Mm -hmm. And so my mother and stepfather were the communist side of my family. Mm -hmm. My father remained a liberal Democrat. He was actually chair of the state Democratic Farmer Labor Party. But he had to give up politics uh, as part of his sobriety Mm -hmm. because it was – he went as he was getting sober, he realized that politics and alcohol were just totally connected for Mm -hmm. him. So he had to give it up to stay dry. But all four – and he remarried too. And all four of those parents who lived a couple miles away from each other were professors at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Okay. So law, 
public policy, women's studies, and physics. Okay. So what I think everything about what I am now can be explained by me rebelling against them, mm. but not completely. Right. Yeah. So I never went to college, mm -hmm. although I've been teaching in colleges for 40 years. Yeah. Either, but, you know, it's like I didn't do the academic route. Yeah. And I have created and worked in one of these deeply political theater, but not according to any of the strictures or ideologies that my parents have. Mm. So I was deeply impacted by their values, but I also went into the arts and did something very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what were those te those te tensions le 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 like for you, um, the trends? Positions and the political up upheaval of the of the sixties and sub seventies. You you mentioned the rebellion, and you also talked about ex experimental th theater. How did these affect you as a as a as a person and and, and come through your art? Well, you know, both of both of my sets of parents were very ideological. Mm -hmm. um, my mother and stepfather very straight down the line, dialectical materialist you know, Marxist Leninists, mm -hmm. and my father, much more a John Kenneth Galbraith kind of liberal New Deal Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I shared a lot of the values that underlay those things. There's a fundamental idea of equality mm -hmm. that are in both of those. There's an idea of the value of every, and of every individual person and that no person is expendable. There's also a sense that we have to, we only find who we are in community mm -hmm. and it's only mm -hmm. by being together. That we, so all of those things, I didn't rebel against. Mm -hmm. I rebelled against the rules and strictures and ideologies and the experimental theater looked like a wonderful pool yeah. to dive into. You yeah. know, what I, what I, most of our listeners won't remember, but the 60s and early 70s is a very messy time and the counterculture contained everything from hard left radical politics to the drug culture mm -hmm. to Guru Maharaji, just this this sort of stew mm -hmm. of political, cultural, internationalist dissent mm -hmm. in which we didn't sort of distinguish between all those things. Yeah. And it, it all was part of the counterculture, right, right? Right. And I found a home in the aestheticized counterculture, yeah. the, the, the rebellious experimental theater that didn't believe in story, mm -hmm. that attacked the mm -hmm. proceedings March, you know, yeah. all things now yeah, that yeah, feel yeah. a little silly, yeah. but were very important at the time. At that time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the questions that we added that we have, we just asked a few of our guests for the upcoming Fat Ham ep episode is about the support that they did or, or didn't have in their you, 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 youth. So I'm wondering, and that then we can pivot away from from your, your youth, but I'm, I'm wondering what type of support you did have as a, a young artist, and was it in intentional mentorship artists you looked up to? And for that matter, what support do you now wish that you had looking back? I, I honestly think, Carly, I was incredibly lucky. Mm. Um, and one of the ways that I used to tell the story of running away from home and joining the circus, joining, living at the performing garage, you know, just was was sort of as this swashbuckling piratical story of, you know, me avoiding all <laughs> institutions and all establishment ways and look at what I made for myself. And all of that is true. But in recent years, I've also realized there's another way of telling that story, mm -hmm. which is I, despite my lack of a college degree, I'm a highly literate highly verbal, tall, straight, white man from Minnesota. Mm. And another way to tell the story is I floated on such a sea of privilege mm. that I could get away with doing all those things. Mm. I didn't have to get a college degree to successful. Yeah. I didn't have to do. And, you know, now looking back, mm. re recognizing that it really alters my sense mm. um, of how much I was given, mm. which was an enormous amount. Yeah. And my parents disapproved of what I was doing with great vehemence, but they never tried to stop me. Mm. They never threw real obstacles in my way. They let me leave home, and you know, when I say run away from home, they weren't looking for me. They knew I was gone. They knew. 
and they let me do it. Yeah. And, you know, they talked to me on the phone and they, it, it, it's hard to explain that it, I was rebelling, but I was rebelling within an extremely supportive environment. Yeah. They, they, mm. were, they were, they were hardwired mm-hmm. to love me and support mm-hmm. me. And that made a huge, huge difference in the risks I was able to take mm-hmm. as a young man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there definitely something about, I think, that rebellion with sub- support, right, which right. which I feel helps you sort of, it feels like I can take a risk, but it's also safe because I have, I have all these people here That's to right. say, well, if you fail... We'll be here, but we won't tell you. But then, we'll, but then we will, right? And and I have to say, in the most primitive possible way, mm-hmm. my mom just loved the hell out of me. Mm. She thought I was so. She was my biggest fan until mm. the day she died. Mm. It used to irritate my wife to no end that <laughs> my mother would come visit and just think I could do no wrong. <laughs> Nor I was happy to tell her what I did do wrong. But but that unconditional love. Yeah. Uh, it just has a, you know, it's a huge impact. I don't think I could have done half of the things yeah. I'd done without that. Yeah, that's that's really. I I think about that in terms of my own children and just people and in, in, mm. in my whole, whole life and 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 how that sort of love and 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 care is like a m- m- buttress, right, of right. of support. And that's you're right. like, all right. But you like I believe in you, so just keep doing it, right? I, I, I just one last thing about my childhood because yeah. I can't resist. <laughs> I you know I spent much of my middle age trying to understand why I was this incredible contradiction. That on the one hand I was incredibly self confident, mm. you know I could walk into a room full of Nobel Prize winners and mm. you know so I think I'm as smart as any of these guys. I wasn't, <laughs> but I would think that. <laughs> But then in the end, then there are other areas in which I was so insecure mm. that I would break out in flap sweat. Mm. That I, and I was thinking, what? And one day, it suddenly struck me, and I laughed because it was so stupid. Mm. I am incredibly self-confident mm. about all the parts of me that my mother embraced. Mm. And all the parts of me she didn't embrace, I'm still a nervous wreck. Mm. And it's that simple. It's not that wow, complicated. Wow, wow, know? wow, wow. Yeah. No, so, but that, I mean... That's true. So now I'm going to think, what should I embrace about my kids and then, and then to help them, right? Um, <clears throat> that feels, though, like a a classic kind of not 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 There are so, so 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 many artists I know that have a so, so similar way of mm. be. Being this this industry asks so m- much of us, and also asks us to process some emotions for consumption a l- lot of the uh, t- time. Sure does. Do do you still find yourself processing that that contradiction, and how do you guide others through through that as well? Yeah. No. I. You know. The, the good news about my insecurity is I feel like I can harness it to make me vulnerable mm. and to make me listen and mm-hmm. to make me humble mm-hmm. in a way that if I just paid attention to the other parts of me, I would be completely insufferable. So that's, that's great. It's often painful, but it's great. And, you know, honestly, a whole lot of my dramaturgy, which is the thing that you know, sort of got me where I am, mm-hmm. is working with writers, is really just a question of trying to love them as mm-hmm. best I can, mm-hmm. which means I have to understand them. Mm-hmm. I have to know them if mm-hmm. I'm going to love them. Mm-hmm. And then I have to help them realize the best version of themselves, mm-hmm. the best version of this idea they have. And and really, of course, I have technical tips and structural ideas and notes and that kind of stuff. But what I'm really trying to do is just listen really hard and reflect back to them the Mm -hmm. perfect image of what they're imagining. Mm. And hopefully they can see themselves Mm -hmm. or see their play in Mm -hmm. that mirror and it starts Mm -hmm. getting better and better. Mm -hmm. And you do. You've given notes to me. (laughs) Thank you. I I try. Still remember them. (laughs) Trying to change the number. Um, Okay, so we have a a lot of feedback from 
listeners on this show that are not in the industry. Uh But I also think that there are just as many people out there who don't know all the ins and outs um, but just love theater, right? So for those people, someone who's in the car or or at home, I'd love for you to to answer what might seem like a very basic question. But what is – Exactly. Does an artistic director do? Um, and I don't mean in the, ge- the general sense. I, th- I think yep. we we get that. But what does a typical day look like? And how do you balance all the needs of an institution this large and established? What an artistic director does is a problem I've been working on for 47 years now. I've been an artistic director for 47 years. Six different theater companies. Um, None of them anywhere near as important as the public theater. So this is, this last 20 years of the public has been the climax of my career. And here's the things I'll say. The, The core part of my job is I am responsible for fulfilling the mission of the theater. And among other things, that means I'm responsible for the artistic quality of everything we do, of every choice we make. It doesn't mean I make all those choices, but it means I have to stand behind them. I'm responsible for them. Mm -hmm. So often what that means, as in the case of the woman sitting across the table from me, (laughs) is I'm responsible for hiring the people who make the choices. Mm -hmm. So I've got to hire the right people. Mm -hmm. I've got to pick Mm -hmm. the plays that fulfill the mission and that are excellent. I have to pick the directors. I have to prove the casting. Um, Projects in development I have to work on for years, pick what we develop and work on for years. All of those things I do with the aid of a lot of other people, but ultimately I'm responsible for it. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, in a way, any artistic director is saying is judge me by the results. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, Mm -hmm. one of a a very nasty football coach, Mm -hmm. but a very smart one, Bill Parcells, you know, used to say, you want to know how good we are? Look at the score. Mm. And it was that simple. It's that mm. if you're good, you win. Mm-hmm. If you're not good, you don't win. And yeah. it's the same with theater. If mm. we're good, we make work that people care about and want to see. Right. And sometimes that means they support it by buying tickets. Sometimes it means that they support it by giving money. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, who knows? Mm-hmm. But people have to want to see what mm-hmm. we do. They have to care and think what we do is important. Mm-hmm. And it's my job to... A, oversee all the art and make those choices, but then B, particularly at the public, it's my job to tell the story of the public over and over and over, Mm -hmm. not just the history, but what we stand for now, and Mm -hmm. try to, by talking, by Mm -hmm. persuading, by painting the picture, help people understand how all of this different activity makes sense, Mm -hmm. how it's one theater, not seven different programs. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. oof, yes. And then I have to make the budget balance too. Ugh. I have a partner with that. Patrick Williams, the executive <laughs> director, is um, a co-CEO with me. But we have to work together to make the budgets work. And that's sometimes the least fun part of the job. The least fun, yes. That is, oof, that is a lot. <clears throat> yes. Um, so, okay. So le- leadership in six different institutions. Has your... Le- a uh, leadership ch- style changed over the y- y- years, and how does the context around the institution, the size, the, the, the location, and things like that affect how you manage and a le- a lead? <clears throat> Those are two beautiful interrelated questions. <laughs> Every theater that I've run has been in a different community mm. and has a different role in that community. Mm. And I feel like the core, the first entry-level question you have to answer when you take over one of these places is, what role is it serving? What additional role could it serve? Mm. And how are we going to do it in an excellent manner? How are we going to fulfill that role well? Mm. And this is very different from, say, when I ran Trinity Rep in Rhode Island, which is the State Theater of Rhode Island, the largest cultural institution of the state. Mm -hmm. And we, in a way, had stewardship over the cultural lives of all of the million people who lived in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So I had to make theater for all of them. I had to go Mm -hmm. out to them. I had to bring them in. Mm -hmm. It was a a civic institution as much as Mm -hmm. a theater. At the public, we have a really important role in New York. We have a really important role in the communities of New York. But we also have a really important role in the American theater as a whole. Mm -hmm. And the way our community here is the community of all of the American theater. And it's our job to set examples, 
to create work that other people can do, mm -hmm. to pioneer programs mm -hmm. who, when they're successful, other theaters can look at them. So in a way, we're at the leadership of the American theater community as much as we're in New York. Yeah. And those, those yeah. things are different with everything. Mm -hmm. Has my style changed? Oh, boy, I hope so. And at least from my limited point of view, the beautiful thing about this is as I've gone back to letting many more people into the dialogue about what we do, the public's decisions have gotten better. Mm. It's actually improved the theater. It's not mm. just nicer. It's mm -hmm. actually better theater. Yeah. And that's that's a relatively recent change that I still can't <laughs> say I've mastered, but I'm yes. trying. I'm trying. Okay. For those of you that follow the public theater, pay attention to the New York arts and culture scene, or just follow the news, then you might have heard a bit about some recent shifts here at the public. As I mentioned before, we all know the past few years have been hard. And leading an institution like this means making some difficult decisions, ones that people don't always understand or agree with. This interview happened earlier in the year, before some of these decisions had been finalized and announced, so we don't get to talk about them specifically. But we did have a chance to talk with Oscar about what he believes is important to theater, how he makes decisions, and what he sees as the future for this industry. I'm, I'm glad, glad, glad you said the, the word access, um, and uh, you just talked about it in a very in a broad sense in terms of how we as an institution impact artists and as as they come into the pub a public back in 2016 you did an interview for Vogue where you've said where you said I've always loved teaching it forces you to distill what you care about most so I'm wondering if we can talk a bit about <clears throat> For that, but in the context of career development and and cultivation, how do you go about ensuring that institution like like the public creates pathways for growth, um, access, and development amongst the staff? And is that distillation still an active part of your day to to, to today, even when you're not in a literal classroom? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that the the mentoring and support of younger artists and leaders mm. and just staff members um, is the most important thing I do. Mm. And I do it probably about half the time and the other half the time I raise money <laughs> and then I try to <laughs> pick a few plays. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, it really it matters enormously to me. And one of the changes as part of our cultural transformation at the public that I'm so happy about is we just explicitly said that teaching and career development is now one of our prime goals, mm -hmm. that every manager in every department is responsible for the career development of the people that report mm -hmm. to them. And, you know, I always sort of did that informally, but it's kind of wonderful to say, oh, no, this is actually my job. Right. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. it was a very bittersweet victory in the first year of the pandemic our artistic staff got decimated because we had six people hired off our artistic staff to be artistic directors at other theaters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, that was hard for us. It was a big loss. Mm -hmm. But what it meant was it was working. So I'm glad, glad you brought up the pen pandemic. You've jo you jo joined the, the public in 2005 and you have... <laughs> shepherded us through some fa some fa fantastic grow, 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 growth. And then in 2020, you're also at the helm as we have to deal with, as the entire w world is dealing with, with COVID. Yeah. So can you talk for a minute about the, that experience, what it was like to have to l l lead such an established institution when the entire world felt like it was upside uh, down? Uh, after March 12th, 2020, when the theaters closed in New York, I was actually in the hospital with COVID when the theaters closed. Right. So I went into the hospital with the theaters all running, and by the time I came out, it was a ghost town. Mm. 
Uh, and the, the next two years were the hardest and worst years of my professional life, without mm. exception. Mm. And it was because the size of the crisis was um, absolutely unprecedented. The American theater has never had a crisis this large, this nationwide. Mm -hmm. uh, and because the combination of the cries for racial justice as well as, and, and equity in the broadest sense, as well as the strictures of not being able to fall under COVID, uh, were a ferocious combination, mm -hmm. but actually fundamentally a good one. Mm -hmm. Because what actually happened is that George Floyd was murdered and a whole bunch of people said they're not gonna take it anymore at exactly the moment when the theater had ground to a halt anyway. So we had an opportunity to remake it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. And so now, the big thing I define my job as is I have got to lead this theater back to economic health, which it has not succeeded at yet, but we will. We'll get mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I need to resist the counter-revolution. I need to resist the blowback mm -hmm. that has already started against some of the gains we made in the last three years. And I have to make sure that the changes that we made are deep enough into mm -hmm. the structure of the theater that we will withstand the... Um, the Thermidor, as scholars of the French mm -hmm. Revolution call it, the counter-revolution. Mm -hmm. But then I also did one final task, which is um, I have, I think my job is to stabilize this theater economically, culturally, artistically, so that I can hand it off to the next people mm -hmm. in fantastic shape mm -hmm. with the best possible chance they have of succeeding. Mm -hmm. Because one of the terrible things I'm seeing, we're seeing all around the country right now, is that a lot of young artistic directors of color got handed broken, poisonous yeah. theaters yeah. that were never gonna make it, yeah. and said, here, fix this. Right. And it's, it's a terrible thing to do to young artistic yeah. directors, and I am very worried about the backlash yeah. that's gonna come when theaters fold and artistic directors get blamed and, you know. So I need to not be part of that trend. I need to hand off a really solid yeah. institution, yeah. if I can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you m mentioned G G George Floyd and the contradiction that was 2020 while we were both in the middle of a pandemic and an up rising. Yep. And as we've mentioned a few, if, a few times we've been involved in, in this cultural transformation process for a couple of years yeah. to get together. Um, and I and honestly, I've 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 really appreciated the shifts I've seen in internally over over Good. those Good. Year, years. I, I feel like I can always I can always pinpoint moments because I've been in those meetings and I've been yeah. seeing things on a very kind of micro level a level um but it's it's not been easy and and personally I feel like we we still have a long way to way to go sure. how did the sh sh shutdown affect your view of Lead leadership at the at the public and with within the industry. Well, in so many ways, I can't name them all. But mm -hmm. one of one of the first and simplest was that there was permission in the summer of twenty for a whole lot of people to express a whole lot of anger and criticism mm -hmm. of me, and it was all it was everything together that made that possible. And although. It was painful. I like to think it was also because fundamentally a lot of people knew that I could hear it and I would hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was so. I mean, you mentioned it a little bit just now, but was was that was that criticism hard to to take? And I think earlier you said something that's stuck with me, and maybe I'm paraphrasing, but you wrote on a sea of. A privilege, and yep. and you just said something. So similar in terms of not de de depending on flat fla flattery, which is an interesting way to th yep. th think of it. So, what is it that makes you frame your past that that way? And does your does your awareness of that of that privilege now affect you as an artistic 
Lee leader. Yeah, well, it certainly has changed my view. And uh, one of the things that I think is done in a salutary way is make me a lot more humble mm -hmm. um, and a lot less cocky about mm -hmm. how right I am. Um, and to just acknowledge uh, how many other voices are necessary to make the public a great theater. Mm. You know, I I try very, very hard now. I, You know, I had to face, because I got told a lot, mm -hmm. that um, people felt, you know, if bullied, perhaps it's too strong, but certainly felt intimidated by me, mm. that I would get, you know, irritated and mm -hmm. they'd feel completely shut down, like they mm. couldn't say anything. Mm. And I just had to say, oh, yeah, I got to take responsibility for this because, of course, in many ways, I'm now one of the very oldest people on staff, too. Mm. So I'm a really old, successful leader, and I better watch my behavior mm. a lot more if yeah. I want the people around me to give me their best. Right, right, right. And I'm right. really trying hard to do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm t I made a commitment that all of the important artistic decisions of the theater would be made at a table with five other people around him, mm. half white, right. half not, uh, people of color, half men, half women, they, mm. my associate artistic directors and managing director and um, uh, director of producing. And that commitment, it doesn't mean that I'm still responsible, but there's been like three times in the last three years that I've had to go, yeah, I disagree with you guys, we're gonna do this. Mm. Most of the time, we come to a consensus mm -hmm. together. And the decisions are better mm. because of that. And yeah. absolutely see it every day. Yeah. And so that is exciting to me to also say, if we can solidify this kind of leadership, mm -hmm. so this form of collective thinking becomes a hallmark of the public as well, yeah. that would be pretty great. Yeah. Um, to, to, to that end, thinking about... Lee, Lee leadership, you mentioned earlier how you feel a lot of young ADs of, of color have been put in difficult positions, and you've joked about money and spending half your time fund raising, and then sometimes picking uh, plays. Can, can we talk for a minute about the just, just the basic economic not economics of our industry. There's an obvious difference between theater and, and film, and the way that theater, both nonprofit and commercial, produces a re revenue. What do you think is the economic future of the 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 theater? We we know that audiences aren't coming back like they you you used to. So I'm wondering what you see as the path forward is that stri 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 streaming, new media, and, and how does that affect pro programming stri stri strategy? Um, you accused me of joking when I said I spent half my time fundraising. And I realize you're right. It's more like 70% of my time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. This for I can't speak for the industry as a whole, but mm -hmm. I know for the public mm -hmm that we have always depended primarily on contributed revenue mm -hmm. and we need to keep that up. Mm -hmm. And partly it's because we give away all those seats in Central Park yeah. for free, right. partly it's because we're committed to keeping our prices low, but really more fundamentally it's because we're trying to change people's idea of what the theater is. Mm -hmm. It's not a, something you buy special access to for the special privilege and you got a seat and nobody, right. it's there for everybody. Right. And that means we, you know, we have to think of it like we think of the public library. Mm -hmm. The public library doesn't sell books. Right. They don't sell memberships. They're there to let you take those books home for free. Mm. It, success for me would be making that a permanent part of the public's profile mm. where it's understood that mm. everything is free. Mm. The last several years have seen an explosion of art in new ways. From Zoom theater to audio plays, augmented reality, and immersive experiences, innovation in the digital and virtual spaces has become an unavoidable and exciting part of our theatrical landscape. For this episode, I also sat down with Sarah Ellis of the Royal Shakespeare Company and Scarlett Kim from the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Now, we're all friends, so this is not the entire interview, but I feel so fortunate to be in the company of innovation and digital leaders at legacy organizations. 
We could have continued the conversation for hours, and maybe we will, but that'll have to wait for next season. This is really exciting. Um, I feel like I'm like a, I'm like f- f- fan of gar- gar- girling a little bit because I'm on this podcast with both of you. I know Scarlett, we'd been te- texting about what the three of us could do, do together for quite some time and and just thinking about and then and then I think I thought wait let's just have them both on at the same time that feels like a great start to whatever we could do and then we'll figure everything else out else out after that so um so um I just wanted I just wanted to uh, get started by having you both introduce do 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 yourselves if you could t- t- tell us your name pronouns if you'd l- 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 like to share and how you would Id- identify within this industry um uh, I'm Sarah Ellis. I'm director of digital development at the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I'm fangirling back at you both. Um, it's it's a real um, really wonderful thing to be part of this podcast and, and together with you. Um, my role at the RSC, I've been doing it for like, I think just over 10 years. And it's it, it really is about um, how we're welcoming new parts of our world into, into theatre making effectively and has been extending the theatre making toolkit. But it's also about um, where generations meet and, and where people meet. And that is what theatre has done wonderfully over hundreds of years so we're just in a moment if you know what I mean and so my job is more about people than technology Mm. um, at the moment and it's great to be here and with you and Scarlett. Mm. Scarlett? Hello I'm Scarlett I use she her pronouns I am also fangirling so that's happening in all directions. Um, I am an artist, creative producer, um director currently i am associate artistic director and director of innovation and strategy at the oregon shakespeare festival um where i see my role as being two prong um one is to produce xr immersive all kinds of um projects and artistic work that expands the definition of theater And the other prong being thinking about uh, art as a form of entrepreneurship and um, expanding how we do our business in the performing arts industry. So I uh, have been at OSF for the past two years and change, um, invited by Nataki Garrett to come be a part of a collaborative and rhizomatic artistic leadership team charged with thinking about the future of theater and theatrical storytelling. Great to be here. Great. Thank you. Um, so before before we dive, 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 dive in talking about the state of our industry and, and how we plan to solve all the problems of the where, where, where world, I would lo- love for each of you to just talk a bit about yourselves. If we could uh, back, uh, back up and start at the v- very beginning, uh, which I hear is a very good place to start. Uh, do you rem- remember the first time that you fell in love with th- theater? When w- was it and what was so special about that mo- moment? Anyone who feels like they want to go first? Well, I can jump in. And the moment that comes to mind for me, um, I I knew that I wanted to, I I thought I was, I I thought I wanted to be a writer. And then I moved here to the States alone um, to go to boarding school in Boston. And um, I was cast as Blanche Dubois in Streetcar Named Desire. And that was a transformative experience for me um, because it really allowed me to see theater as a laboratory where I can perform different versions of myself and kind of rehearse how I want to exist in the world um, and to test out uh, what is true for me, what feels true for my body and test out kind of how I interacted with other people. And, you know, as I was listening to hours and hours of the dialect of, um, 
of that character, it really um, empowered me to think about theater as 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 a kind of um, R and D for for life, for myself, for society, and um, performance as as a kind of way to think about truth through a very pluralistic lens. So I think that was kind of my um, a reckoning that comes to comes to mind. But growing up, I was. Korean shamanism was a really big part of uh, where I grew up in Korea and that um, the sacrilegious, profane, kind of community-oriented, abundantly food-driven, um, utilitarian healing ritual and ceremonies of Korean shamanism, I think, is the bedrock of how I think about theater as a kind of public agora for um, exchange and transformation. Wow. Wow. That's gorgeous. Um, I didn't. I I um, I came to theatre as an art form quite late. I studied music, so like I definitely had a connection as a child. It was very much that collective uh, experience around music that that really inspired me and got me. And um, I think theatre is not dissimilar you, with music as well. It's very collaborative. You. you where if whatever city you go to, wherever you travel, if you, do you know what I mean, you can connect with people, and I think it's is very similar. Um, but I think so. I was sort of like one of those kids where, like, at, for the school trip, we would go to the theatre, and that really moved me. And I think that that's a really important part of education, learning, and arts learning, and things like that. But but what really got me was when um, how I got into this space was basically an ex-boss and mentor just took me to see plays. And I remember seeing a play by Debbie Tucker Green and being held on every single sentence that was written in that play. And what I loved about it was um, what I thought or all the sort of mini absolutes I had in my head around opinion were utterly, utterly transformed and I walked away knowing that theatre is this a beautiful space to throw so many ideas in a room together and let people imagine and empathise in different characters and different contexts. And I think that was very transformative. And I think I've always held that as a really massive convening power around the potential of theatre and, and what it can do. I think... For me, theatre is one of those art forms which is one of the most, can, has the most sort of human connection in it. Um, and looking at character and looking at story and looking at, um, I mean, I think the pandemic really highlighted how we crave touch, how we crave connection. And if you don't have those aspects in your life what that does to you and I think we're also seeing in that that in the behaviors that are coming out of the pandemic when we don't have we don't look people in the eye and understand the impacts of of what you say or how you connect and so for me I think theatre has a huge as an art form has a huge potential when we're looking at a whole generation of people that connect virtually and in person that we can disrupt those virtual spaces and provide greater connection and meaning in, in ways that are wonderful and wondrous and transformative. And I think that that's where I've always thought about, you know, when, when you have virtual connection in theatre, it's not making them feel furthest away that you're experiencing something that other people are, are having a live experience and you're getting the broadcast version I really want to think about how we get really close to you in your home or really close to you wherever you are and however you're experiencing that theatre and how we can sort of grow, like grow the connection together. Um, and I think that that is one of the really profound things about theatre is it, 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 it doesn't, how can I put it? Um, a director will light uh, a scene and get you to look at certain aspects on mm -hmm. stage. Uh, uh, a performer will read a line in a particular way to get you to see it or, or hear them in a particular way. 
it's hard as an audience member to turn away from that when you're in that mm. and present in that and 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 with having that co-presence together and I love that I love that real timeness of it um and I love the ephemeralness of theatre I love the fact that those who were there at that moment were the people who were there and you experienced that and that in some ways it isn't replicable in such a data driven way and I I think me and Scarlett were having a conversation about this the other day is that we're in such an absolute world where we're looking at absolute technology being quite absolute and there's something glorious about the stickiness and the lack of quantifiableness about the arts and about theatre that's important when we're so unsure as a society right now it's okay to Mm. not know the answer Mm. yeah I've got many a time I've got in trouble by being pathologically optimistic um but uh um no I I, I take it's it's weird isn't it but sometimes you do need the optimism to it basically the, the the some of the biggest learnings I've had over the past few years and particularly sort of like looking at that sort of it was actually a really it was a date it was a line in the sound it was a date where our theater shut that's that that apps it's not even a something that gradually evolved is it it's like the pandemic happened but it was a date where our theatre shut Mm -hmm. and we never we we had to grieve we had to be in the moment we had to respond we had to um be tactical we we a lot of things we weren't in our gift Mm -hmm. um and in that moment everything changed and so through that like you know where we were going as an organization was very much on this innovation track and we had Mm. levels of confidence and sort of like optimistic certainty which never really existed it was just but it was there it was sort of like um we were on a track and we were going to develop work and we had all of those yeah, we had we had a confidence in the distribution of that work. We had, a, I mean, we had much more solidity, even though it probably wasn't as solid as we thought it was. But we 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 were working in more solid times. And then the pandemic hit, and actually, the thing that struck me most, and the thing that I can't, like can't turn away from, which we hadn't been discussing pre-pandemic enough. At, at all through an, an innovation lens was the huge digital inequity that's out there mm. and the digital mm. inequity in people's homes, the digital inequity mm. across how we design for a lot of innovative work or perceived digital work and how that, that for me is the thing that's really stuck with, with us is that, you know, to, that those inclusive futures must include technology that's in the hands of the people that you want to share that with and mm. that you can make work that can um, use, do you know what I mean, use, use new tools, et cetera, but actually innovation through pra- practice and performance has become way more on my radar than the actual tools that we were using to do that. And I think that's been quite a... Um, you know, quite le- like quite important in how we look at our practice and how we um, don't infantilize the tools in which in which we're given, and we we are a critical friend friend for that in terms of theatre. We are a critical friend because the values of theatre can then look at a technology such as AI and interrogate it rather than just assume that we'll use those technologies. Um, it, the, the theatre is a really robust muscle of of art form there, if you know what I mean, in order to sculpt that. Um, but that, those were the profound shifts, really, over the past few years, is how do you... Um, so a lot of it wasn't about the product anymore. It wasn't about the piece that became significant. It, it became about the infrastructure and the design systems and and how how we create those infrastructures um more equitably and and more usefully for our audiences where are our audiences at and what they're craving so that we design with them in mind um became much more resonant and then the other thing is um in making that work pay um freelancers expertise 
and that makes the work slower when you're actually looking at the design systems you have to look at the the power structures within that too to ensure um that that you are um making work in an inclusive way as well as thinking about your audiences inclusively yes yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> um i can, love go ahead go ahead can i can i respond to that because i feel so yeah. inspired always by you too but sarah what you were just saying you said something to me a few months ago when we were having an amazing stack of pancakes um of something about like uh change makers and decision makers and um going from being a change maker to a decision maker and i've been mm. really meditating on that because in my role i mean innovation is in my title. So sometimes I, I, I'm like a symbol of change, <laughs> you know, so I wrestle with how to, you know, that's not obviously not a mono, monolithic thing. That's all kinds of things, but I'm like, well, you know, how do we um, think about change as not something that's optional or on the fringes or something that comes after the decision, but something that's built in and foundational to how we make decisions, how we, um, uh, create infrastructure uh, from the ground up um, with this mind towards change. So I just um, that that framework. I, I you know really grateful for for pancakes and change making frameworks Those from you. Pancakes, Galia. I've never eaten so many okay. um, pancakes in my life. But but the, it is um, right. I think that the <laughs> pandemic shifted us from outliers to much more integrated aspects of our our organizations and our company and that we can't again we can't move back from that so when we're talking about inclusivity actually our roles have been othered and outliered and, and and been seen as change when actually our roles are integral to what theatre is about today and we want to work with that and it's not always about changing what's brilliant about theatre it's it's about the muscle and the tissue and the connectivity and looking at it as much more organic ecosystem of what theatre is. And that actually, you know, in the more traditional aspects of our art form, it is really about how they, those areas are inclusive and, and, and elitism and exceptionalism are problematic with a generation coming through that have experienced what it is to be cut off. Um, so that's, it is about, and, and I think that you, I think that as a decision maker, rather than a change maker, it does change your approach and your set of responsibilities. And so it, a lot of the time, it's also reminding yourself that you're, it, you're not that outlier anymore. And actually it's hard. It's actually hard to integrate and, 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 and be in those decision making processes because you get, you get different scenarios in that too. Um, so it's it's uh, a very live conversation for all of us, actually. Um, I think we all want to lose we all Preach. we all want to lose the the, the D word, <laughs> the digital word. We want to lose that. Um, and I think, like uh, you're you're saying, Scarlett, to have artistic leadership that celebrates um, a multiplicity of programming. Mm. Uh, celebrates um, Galia, our roles in our in the spaces that we're in, and recognizes that um, one of the biggest risks you can take in the arts around around ambition is um, paralyzing yourself um, with, with not taking that that risk of a piece of work and how we deal with risk artistically in many angles, and it's a craft and it's um, it's not maverick, it's actually really considered and really well put together and that actually a space for listening to um, that and thinking about our relevance and thinking about our purpose as, as um, convening spaces for, for, for the general public um, and where they're at now is, 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 we're not in competition, if you know what I mean. The infrastructure shouldn't be in competition with each other. Um, we are, it is the world we're in right now. I mean, it's been so, so important to my soul to be in community with you all and other, you know, um, 
kind of folks who are inhabiting this innovation kind of role in inside of um, especially legacy organizations and institutions that are stra straddling preservation and innovation and how do we it's sometimes so eerie to me <laughs> kind of the specific resonances between all of our experiences but that also it, it gives me a lot of sure. um empowers me to think about well like there's a if we're able to detect these patterns around how we're navigating um, legacy into change, um, that's actually, you know, I'm so I'm really excited about that field connection and how do we how do we uh, build together? How do we build these resources together? I mean, Sarah, even just the conversations that we've had around, well, we both now have a virtual OSF and virtual RSC, like some of the challenges around distribution and access, so resonant. Yeah. And it's I'm I was so excited to have that conversation with you on such a specific and deep level in a way that sometimes I feel like I'm a, a startup inside of this large uh, machine. So that has yeah. been kind of the treasures that I carry, carry with, with me. And, you know, I'm, I'm very um, lucky that I uh, had, had Nataki Garrett as my boss who, you know, really sought to redefine what is our primary business as a theater producing organization? How do we think about things that um, so much assumptions around like season? What is our season? And how do we actually strip away all the assumptions and um, uh, 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 I guess calcified uh, status quo around it and actually have an opportunity to redefine what that is expansively and through the lens of inclusion. So you know, um, when I first came into my role, I remember Nataki kind of jokingly uh, saying to me in private, like, oh, we're going to um, this this job is kind of going to be staging a coup <laughs> inside of the uh, context of American theater, which can be mm. so um, so much allegiance to kind of um, uh, how things always were and how things should be. Mm. And mm. there's so much in place that reinforces uh, that this is our business and anything other than that, thinking about things in terms of access and abundance, I, I have found really can trigger fear of obsolescence. I think it can trigger and destabilize um, cultural elitism. So in that context of the American theater industry, that's how I came into this role of maybe this is would be kind of staging a coup. And I, I'm forever grateful for that invitation mm -hmm. and framing. I lo love this, this conversation around building infrastructure, um, especially as, as it relates to, to the support that that infrastructure can provide abide for both the audience and the artist and and how we push back against that elitism but i i want to go back for a second because both of you actually all three of us have the words innovation or digital or, or media in our titles um and can you each talk about bit about what that intersection of theater and me me media means for for you what 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 was it to draw what what was it that drew drew you um to 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 to, to the idea of utilizing these digital strategies in the side of art forms that a lot of people could see as analog? Well, you know, I'm a hybrid person. You know, I, I feel like my life story and how I see myself is has always been kind of uh, liminal, hybrid. Uh, I'm often occupying multiple identities. I'm often in, in between spaces. So to me, you know, um, I, digital uh, tools just felt like it's expanding my toolkit of what theater is to me, you know, and I think about when we curate art, I mean, I, what does that word even mean curate? It's, I'm actually trying to intentionally not use that word because it has so much gatekeeping associations around it. But when we engage artists, you know, I'm thinking first and foremost about 
artist mobility? How can we support artists move between disciplines and mediums and industries? How can we, um, how can I be the catalyst of um, supporting an artist in thinking about their practice expansively and through an entrepreneurial lens? So it feels like media and digital um, feels like just more abundance, just more uh, dishes of delicious food on the our communal table. You know, I'm, I'm, um, uh, uh, multiple things can be centered at the same time. And I, I resonate with, you know, what Sarah was saying. It doesn't, sometimes I, I observe that digital um, is experienced as a kind of betrayal or a, a, like a replacement of liveness as we know it. But I'm actually really excited about how digital provides new opportunities for thinking about liveness anew. Yeah, um, but digital is not actually in my title. Um, my title is director of innovation and strategy. And, you know, honestly, some of the most fulfilling work that I've done here in my role has been like the nerdy work of rewriting commissioning contracts so that um, it thinks about ownership of the IP differently for artists or um, using technology empowered tools to revamp our grant tracker to allow more fluid converse, uh, communication between our producers and our development team. So sometimes to me, the digital is not necessarily the content of the work, but more um, uh, like we've been saying, the infrastructure or the kind of foundational technology that can um, allow us to collaborate more fluidly. Yeah, I mean, I've got three D words in my title. <laughs> so it's yeah, like, you do. You have um, a, yeah. DDD. <laughs> um, and and they're just becoming more and more, I mean, obsolete, really, which I love because I talk about obsolescence in the company and the company are like, what? What are you saying? And I'm like, no, no, I'm really comfortable with obsolescence. I'm comfortable, like success of my job is you don't need like a digital titled human in the in the mm. in the role. But but I think the D word is, is very misleading, really, because, you know, often you get asked if you do the IT system or the website, and that's not, not my job. Oh, my God, but, um, literally, yeah. like, all the time. All the I time. mean, also, there is an absolute global conspiracy against me and photocopiers. Like, I've never met a photocopier that I've managed to use in any successful way whatsoever. So it's there are real, real ironies in my job title. Um, so then it comes back to... I I profoundly think and I'm and I'm curious and I'm interested in alchemy of collaboration between theatre or practitioners and maybe uh, an industry or an aspect that hasn't connected before. And over the past few years, those technology collaborations. If you put artists and engineers together, that alchemy is, 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 is wonderful and delightful and gorgeous. And what I love about that work is the translation piece. I love when you get that, that different thinking coming together um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. seeing what happens to the form and seeing what happens to our work and practice. So I've never been very good at doing the same thing again. Like I'm not, I'm like, okay, what's the, like, I'm not very good at that. Like, that's um I don't know why it's just it just is like, that's a whole different podcast but um what I am curious <laughs> about is um is looking at new new spaces for theatre to, to to be present and and work in and I think um I think it is that that's the thing that's exciting and I'm really lucky that we are living in a moment where we can do that and it is exploratory and we are in a perpetual state of discovery I mean, I've been saying, you know, like Shakespeare was a creative technologist. You know, he was like he was a collage artist. Yeah. You know, he was experimenting with the most cutting edge technology of the time. You know, it's it's um, I, I actually find that way of thinking of, you know, one thing visual theater makes the original theater obsolete. Like, I think that's actually a dangerous kind of thought, actually, because, you know, it's it it means that there's some something that's real and everything that is not that thing is fake or less than and i'm i'm so baffled well i don't know if i'm baffled but i'm disturbed by that the i think theater is resilient and abundant so why are we treating it like it's this brittle fragile thing 
you know, yeah. theater can actually morph and uh, reinvent itself, shape shift constantly. So I'm, I'm, and that's what that ex- excites me about um, uh, the enduring relevance and the power of theater is that it is so, um, it's like that Pokemon ditto, <laughs> or maybe like, yeah. or it's like something that can infinitely permutate. So I'm like, how can we really really think about theater through abundance and through shape shifting and not um, mm-hmm. this thing that, well, if you create a different, ver- take a photo of it. If you take a photo of theater, it's going to, um, the theater is going to go up in flames. Like it's a vampire. Right. Like, no, I think it's actually much more um, resilient. Yeah. It's, re- it's yeah. really resilient. It's been around for ages, but also like, I mean, we, we did yeah. some work in the pandemic where we used some interactivity and what was delightful what it's the power shift at the moment it's sort of like a generation coming through using these technologies that they have in their hands and have always grown up with are just finding it really easy to use if you know what I mean like a mm-hmm. phone and yeah. in, interactivity and all of that is just not something you even have to give instructions for to yeah. a younger generation and then what it's highlighting for some of us is that theatre has been connecting with an older generation and so, again, it's that convergence where you yeah. bring people in, traditional audiences in through the Shakespeare, but out with that technology and, and bring yeah. that other audience in through the tech, but out with the beauty and craft of the Shakespeare. That's a really legitimate right. way of looking at it and how you don't other any of that audience in that experience is, is the really important part of that. And that often... Um, Often it's that that aspect, the onboarding, the making sure people, again, the technology not failing in the moment, not using technology that's inaccessible to people, all of those practical concerns, which those design structures, again, in the pandemic, some were exposed in the pandemic as inequitable in in traditional Mm -hmm. aspects of that. Mm -hmm. You know, our buildings aren't always welcoming to people who don't know what to do or how to behave in the theatre. Yeah. Um, we have mm-hmm. an opportunity mm-hmm. to address that. Um, and yeah. I'm not saying any anything's more right or less right in that, but I think it's important to highlight that. Um, I remember, like, the, my grandma saying the first time she heard a telephone scared mm. the hell out of her. Yeah. Yeah. As she got older, that yeah. was her social media. Yeah. Mm. That was yeah. her technology. So we've got to really think about what's the technology for our generation. Right. Mm-hmm. And right. also right. people reject the technology that's not useful to them. Mm-hmm. So we've got mm. TV was a really massive, huge piece of technology from the mid 1950s onwards. Again, like it became equitable and it became more affordable, if you know what I mean. And my point is mm-hmm. now we're in those mm-hmm. moments again with new set of tools. So mm-hmm. my, you know, what might be my generational technology will not be a young person's generational technology coming through. Um, yeah. But I always remember when she told me that, I found that really fascinating. I know we 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 have, I know time, we're going to aim to start to wrap up. I know we could be here forever. Um, I also I love the fact that this conversation also seems to be revolving around uh, the m- 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 revolving in many ways or around the democratization of access to the arts. And it has me thinking a lot about the fact that all three of us work at institutions that can be seen by a lot of people as large, established a legacy old what does it mean for us to be making this change inside of such established producing orgs especially as we think about the gatekeeping a a lot a lot of underrepresented artists um they feel has been has has been a a part of these a legacy institutions I know I say yeah I'm, I'm trying to I I, I'm trying to figure out how to be um how how to be more polyamorous with institutions and entities mm. like how mm. um I can love begets more love you know I'm mm. I'm thinking yeah. about uh really you know re- recently in the past few months I feel like my work has really centered around sharing out some of my learnings as an iterative evolving you know 
I, I was talking about it in a conference that Sarah and I was just at as um, the loose leaf paper, binder paper in the bottom of my backpack, because that was me as a kid. Like I would just always jot down notes and it was all over the place, but it somehow made sense to me um, in its ent- entropy form. So I'm really excited about sharing out some of those learnings to the field so that we can, we can create our own new systems and, you know, uh, you know, the nonprofit theater producing American theater system doesn't have to be the um, one and only centralized way of thinking about this work. I'm excited about things like Web3 and DAOs and NFTs, all of this decentralized technology, which kind of has been co-opted by the tech bro world to Mm. make it it seem like it's a nefarious thing. But I think foundationally, there's so much interesting possibility of how we can, that can allow us like empower more decentralized and democratized collaboration. So I think, I think the institution to artist relationship um, you know, I think about that a lot in my in my position and how uh, what my responsibility is. Um, we I was looking at some of uh, our data of the artists that we engaged and thinking about, oh, we created eleven hundred or so paid opportunities for artists mm-hmm. in the theater industry, wow. in the technology industry. Wow. What does that actually mean? A lot of those yeah. um, jobs and gigs are like bespoke titles that we made up and bespoke engagements that we made up. Like, but I am really excited about the economic development for the individual and for our industry, our industry. Um, I, I feel like that's where really my heart, soul and brain is. Um, I get excited about how can we turn, um, operationalize innovation and change into tangible mm. and sustained systems change in our organizations and in our field so that, um, you know, the glass, glass cliff, I feel like so many of us um, are often uh, uh, named as something in an institution or given a whatever role, <laughs> prestigious, blah, 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 and then not actually set up to succeed or thrive. So I'm mm. excited about um, all this ecstatic innovation, but I'm also like, okay, mm-hmm. but what does it actually mean to invest in it long term? What does it actually mean to um, find sustainability for for innovation. Right. So I feel like championing the artists, centering the artists. I think um, uh, uh, important pillar of that is sustainability. Um, you know, earlier Scarlett, you said something that stuck with 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 me. You mentioned redefining what theater can be. So just as we wrap up, I'm wondering what excites you the most about the next three to five years in this industry, right? What's out there that you look at and say, that's the thing that can really change the landscape. This is for for you both. (laughs) Artists. Uh, Artists are going to change it. We, we're going to have the tool, like the tools. So there's a clearing up there, but but really we, um, the sort of what I would call like theatre opening itself up to much more interdisciplinary practices that, that extend the reach of what theatre means and what theatre is about and that plastic, like that real sort of um, network that over the next three to five years, if we can look at that and then the pieces around that, around digital rights, multi-platform experiences frameworks Mm. for distribution that can get out to audiences we can look at ai or we can look at those aspects but actually we need a much broader sense of what theater is if that makes any sense through an artist's lens and performance and practice um Mm. that the the, the tech then that will plug into the technologies and we and we need some serious serious um, look at infrastructures to then deploy that to support the commerciality and the potential of that. And that's not for artists to solve. That is actually for institutions to put in place. I mean, ditto, you know, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I, uh, we just launched a XR workshop here on our campus for our high school, visiting high school groups. And mm. to me, the, um, uh, the metric of success of that program is uh, supporting young people and understanding that they are already making theater. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm 
you know, we just launched this project, Hella Iambic. It is a mobile app game that is designed to be played alongside during our performance of Romeo and Juliet. And it was, it came from this idea um, where Nataki, the director of, uh, uh, also she directed Romeo and Juliet. She was talking about, well, the high school students are already using the phones in the audiences. They're already having this meta theatrical experience of talking to each other. Like how do we actually see what's actually already happening and give radical Mm. permission for people Mm. to be themselves so mm-hmm. I'm excited about, mm-hmm. um, yes, artists are the future. And also um, art is not this thing that is happening at the ca- castle on the top of the hill. Yeah. Art is something yeah. that is profane and mundane and a fabric of, of our culture and our society. And young people mm-hmm. are making art when they make TikTok. And I am excited about <laughs> continuing to democratize access to art for everyone. And I think it is critical that artists lead the way. Okay, so now it's time to say goodbye for just a couple months. It's been a whirlwind of a season. And I am so grateful to everyone who supported the relaunch of this podcast. I'm going to try and list a few names, so please bear with me as I try not to miss anyone. From amazing individuals like Tom McCann, Tam Shell, Julie Danny, Amber Gray, Elizabeth Kip Justy, Amrita Ramanan, Kristen Gongora, Rachel London, Chantel Thompson, Corinne Livingston, Ida Levran, Malachi Kronberg, and Emily White our new media associate, to our fantastic partners, the Public Theater Marketing and Communications team, the staff at Joe's Pub, Gotham Studios, where we do all of our in-studio recording sessions, and Ghostlight Creative Productions. And I cannot forget our producers, John Sloan III and Justin K. Sloan of Ghostlight Creative Productions who help make this podcast look and sound as beautiful as it does. It has been a joy to collaborate with all of you on this season. We've been able to spend the last few months highlighting the many artists and programs of the public theater. So I hope you've been able to learn a bit, laugh a lot, and fall a little in love with who we try to be. No, we don't always get it right, but there's a whole lot of people trying very hard to do so. We'll be back in a couple months. Until then, go back and give this season a binge. I promise you won't be disappointed. And when you do, don't forget to like, subscribe, share, shout out from the rooftops, and give us that five-star rating you know we deserve. From everyone here on the Public Square team, I'm Garlia Cornelia Jones, and we'll see you next time here at the Public Square. Public theater is... The public theater is... The public theater is a gift. To me, the public theater is... Like a neighborhood. You know, you know when you live in a neighborhood or on a block, you can go to each other's house and feel welcome when you walk in, you feel like you're at home. That's what the public theater is for me. Welcome home to the public square. We're so glad to have you back. Today's episode of Public Square 2.0 was hosted and produced by Garlia Cornelia Jones, Director of Innovation and New Media at the Public Theater, with support from New Media Associate Emily White. Script by John Sloan III and Garlia Cornelia Jones. Creative production includes story support by John Sloan III of Ghostlight Creative Productions and audio production by Justin K. Sloan of Ghostlight Creative Productions. Special thanks to Julie Danny, Sarah Ellis, Oscar Eustace, Scarlett Kim, Jessica Slot, and Tom McCann. For a full list of credits, please visit our website, publictheater.org, for the show notes.